Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, wherever you are tuning in. Thank you so much for joining us today for this uh, Saturday edition of uh, Facebook Live or Instagram or wherever you are tuning in, YouTube. And today's offering will be on the topic of equanimity. So happy to be back here on Facebook Live. I, I took some time off uh, to facilitate a retreat and to uh, make a journey over to Portugal, where I'm calling in from today, from Portugal, at uh, the New Life uh, Wellness Community here in Portugal, which, by the way, is a beautiful place to come and visit if uh, you're interested in, in perhaps taking a deeper dive into some uh, healing practices of meditation or or yoga or qigong uh, or you just want to take a nice uh, dive into the beautiful nature of northern portugal uh, yeah please come come up to the new life wellness community and check us out so uh the reason why i'm doing uh facebook lives it seems like they're going to be every thursday evening and, and saturday evening or morning or afternoon wherever you are um, it'll be on Thursdays and Saturdays. So Saturdays uh, offerings will be around the topic of equanimity. Thursdays offerings will be on the topic of mindfulness as it's known uh, primarily in the West, what I'm calling a heartfelt awareness. So a little bit about uh, equanimity and the reason why I'm offering it on Facebook for the next month or so is that I'm leading up to an eight week online meditation program where we're focusing on equanimity. So I'm gonna offer a little bit of information here on the online program before we get into the bulk of today's offering. So the program is entitled Equanimity, the Clear Seeing Heart, and it runs from July 27th to September 18th. There are two sections being offered. The first section, or what I'm calling Section 1, uh, is on Thursdays and Mondays. Uh, this is in Thailand time, Thursdays from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. and Mondays from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. And that uh, equals out to Wednesdays and Sundays, East Coast time, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. on both Wednesdays and Sundays. So that's the first section. Section two is, again, uh, from Thailand. We are broadcasting uh, from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. on Mondays and Thursdays. And if you're... you're joining the retreat from Europe, uh, Portugal, or France. It'll be on Mondays and Thursdays, 10 a.m. to 12 noon. So for more in information on the retreats that I'm offering, uh, either that, this one, the Equanimity course, or the retreat on mindfulness, or what I'm calling heartfelt awareness, I would recommend going to my website, www such sweet thunder.org and all of the details uh, will be there you can also register through the website and if you have any questions about either program feel free to message me on facebook or instagram or send me an email through the website okay so i think we can go ahead and get started so I'll, I'd like to um, yeah, set the stage, so to speak, for uh, this particular offering with a, just a brief guided meditation, what I like to call an arriving practice. And so I'll ring the sound of the bell and I'll just guide us into the present moment and we'll rest there for maybe a minute or so. And then we'll come out of the practice, I'll ring the bell again and we'll launch into the talk. Mm. 
And so the invitation here is just to arrive into this present moment. And there are many ways of arriving and, and connecting to the experience of the present moment. And for this brief practice, perhaps just starting with the sensations of the body. So perhaps just noticing how the body feels right now in this current posture, whether you're you're sitting down or, or lying down or standing up. Just connecting to the, to the feeling of the posture. Perhaps offering yourself a phrase like sitting, and I know that I'm sitting. As a way of connecting to that felt experience of the present moment. We might continue arriving by noticing the contact of the feet against the ground or the floor or the carpet. Or if you're lying down, you might simply notice the temperature of the air against the skin of the feet. And inviting the muscles in the feet to relax, rest, Grow soft. Perhaps noticing the weight of the body against the cushion or chair. Inviting the muscles underneath those sensations to relax and unwind, rest. Perhaps noticing sensations arising from the hands. This might be the hands resting against the body or touching each other. Inviting the hands to relax, grow soft, rest. Perhaps noticing the arms resting against the body or perhaps noticing sensations of clothing against the arms. And inviting the muscles in the arms to relax and rest. We might also notice sensations of clothing against the back. Inviting the muscles in the back to relax, unwind, rest. We might also notice sensations of clothing against the shoulders. Inviting the muscles in the shoulders to unwind, grow soft. There might be sensations arising throughout the back of the neck, in the sides of the neck. Inviting the muscles in the neck to rest. Perhaps noticing sensations arising throughout the cheeks of the face. Letting any tension or stress that's held in the face go. Perhaps noticing sensations arising from the top of the head.
So taking a few moments here just to continue arriving, settling, resting. And if at any point during the meditation you should find you get distracted by thoughts, just know that that's normal. Smilingly recognizing the distraction, letting it go. And gently returning back to the present moment, the felt experience of the body. Resting, resting. As we prepare to move into the upcoming talk, perhaps just connecting with how you might want to arrive, how you might want to, to listen, being present and connected, and perhaps open-hearted to the words that are being offered. In a sense, showing up as an act of generosity and listening. Inviting the words to land directly into the heart. So in the next breath or two, I'll ring the sound of the bell and bring us back into a conversational space. So thank you for, for joining me in that, that very brief guided meditation. And I thought I would start uh, into today's offering uh, by reading a poem. And this poem is uh, from the Zen tradition. And it's a poem that's very, very frequently used uh, when speaking about equanimity. So I, I believe this comes from the sixth century, although I might be wrong about that, but if I'm, if I'm if I remember correctly, this comes from 6th century China. The great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. When love and hate are both absent, everything becomes clear and undisguised. Make the smallest distinction, however, and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. If you wish to see the truth, then hold no opinions for or against anything. To set what you like against what you don't like is the disease of the mind. To set what you like against what you dislike is the disease of the mind. So those words really um, bring forth uh, the wisdom of this quality of equanimity. So what do we mean about equanimity exactly? And there are many ways of defining equanimity. Even in one tradition, the Buddhist tradition, equanimity shows up in, in several different ways. And so how I've come to understand equanimity 
at least one way that I've come to understand it, is the ability to be in the present moment with exactly what's arising. And that, that means exactly what's arising internally and externally. To be with what's there. To, to hold space, in a sense, for, for whatever feelings and emotions might be present. And holding space for what's arising in the external environment as well. In a sense, equanimity can be defined as seeing things as they are, as they arise. Now, this often creates a bit of tension, right? We often uh, go into our life uh, experiencing life uh, as it's arising and at the same time feeling a dissonance to that. You know, there's very often we're experiencing uh, our life and the circumstances of our life, and we are resisting that. We're thinking to ourselves, no, that shouldn't be happening, right? Or this is not how it should be, right? And we, I think we can all feel what that might feel like, particularly right now, there's such division in America you know, today the, the Supreme Court handed down a ruling that, uh, well, at, at least from what I can see, is creating a lot of dissonance, a lot of upset. And that's fine. That's normal, right? And we can take that upset as a sign that we're uh, seeing what's what's arising against how we think things ought to be. And that creates that tension, that dissonance. Right? So equanimity asks us that when we're in the midst of that, equanimity asks us to rest with that. That when we cannot be... Uh, available to what's arising in the present moment, then at least we can hold that dissonance with equanimity. And in a sense, this is brings us to self-compassion, right? You can see here how equanimity and compassion are intimately connected when we're in a challenging situation. Can we hold the emotions of that challenging situation with an open heart? With a, with a kindness towards ourself and with a kindness towards what's arising externally. The great way has no difficulties when we can let go of our preferences and prejudices, our likes and dislikes, our wants, our needs. It's not that those are bad or wrong, or we shouldn't have them, but the practices of equanimity allow us to, yes, honor our preferences and prejudices, our likes and dislikes, and not to be attached to the outcome. Not to be attached to what we think ought to be happening. Because then we're just arguing with the inarguable aspects of the present moment, right? And so when we enter into an argument with uh, the inarguable aspects, we suffer, right? We struggle. There's a tension there, a resistance. And so when that resistance is there, and it's quite normal, uh, particularly when we're perhaps in a country where there's so much division, there's bound to be this tension, right? Can we rest in the experience of that resistance? Can we hold that tension with that open heart? 
when we do that, when we hold the experience of the present moment in this open heart of equanimity, eventually that resistance begins to shift and soften. Eventually we start to see the actual experience of what's arising in the present moment. And we can actually see that as opposed to how we think things ought to be. We see them as two different experiences. When we're caught in the midst of the arguments, we don't see the difference there. We just see what's arising and we say to ourselves, of course, this shouldn't be happening. Right? Of course, that's making me so angry. Right? It just seems so obvious that things are unfolding the way they quote unquote shouldn't be happening. Right? Then we're kind of confused. There's a confusion there. There's a, 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 um, an ignoring of the present moment because our preference towards what we think should be happening is far greater than our ability to connect with what actually is. So these practices of equanimity, so beautiful, so, so helpful, so uh, such a source of resilience and strength. Because it allows us to, to be, in a sense, cultivating a type of peace with what's arising in the present moment and the resistances that are arising within us. And so here's the, the, the time in the talk where I often get this question. What about, you know, what is happening? What, what about uh, how can we move forward for social change, for social justice, and be equanimous at the same time? If we're really letting go of the argument, then ha isn't this just blind passivity? And actually, when we really engage with the practices of equanimity, we recognize that it's the exact opposite of blind passivity. And in fact, the, the resistance to the present moments, that becomes felt as a passive state because it's our, it's our normal reactive process. And when we're in a normal, natural, reactive process, we kind of shut down, we're kind of on autopilot, right? We do this same reactive process, whether it's yelling, kicking, punching, screaming, or shouting, or we just numb out, uh, because that's what we've always done in the past, right? So in a sense, that is a passive state, even though it might seem active, because we might be uh, moving forward in a, in a, in a very um, aggressive way. But it's instinctual. And there's a numbing out there. Equanimity asks us to pause and to really hold in our heart the actual experience of what's arising. It requires uh, really a tremendous amount of courage and bravery. And so when we can do that, we've, we're still engaging with the circumstances of the present moment. We can still feel that disagreement and we've unplugged the reactivity. And this is incredibly powerful. Because now we're able to move forward to address the imbalance, to move forward for social change, if that's what's required, free from our anger, free from the reactivity. 
And that is much, much more powerful. Because when we do move forward with action laced with anger, it naturally will initiate an equal and sometimes greater reaction. We set up a me against them and us against them. And so when, when we're engaged in that type of behavior, that's when the, the war starts. Equanimity asks us to disengage from the war and move forward for that social change with the energy of kindness and compassion. We can, we can meet the, the situation at hand with this energy of the open heart uh, it's much less likely that the people who we're talking to, the people who we're engaging with, are going to meet that open heart with resistance. They're much more likely to hear what we're saying when we offer what we're saying through the quality of equanimity. So I guess the reason why I'm entering into this talk here in this way is because uh, there is so much division right now, not only in America, but in the world. And I often get the question around equanimity, you know, yeah, it's great in theory, but I, I'm really afraid that if I become equanimous, then I won't be able to engage in these types of social justices. And I completely disagree. To allow the, the upset, the tension, the anger, or the fear to inform us. Yeah, that really made me angry. Allow that angry anger to be there for as long as necessary. And then engaging in practices of, of equanimity so that that anger can subside. We still use the information of that emotion. That, that information will still be there, but that, that really, really fiery negative charge can be put aside. And one might think that once we put that anger aside and move forward, because the, the, the fiery heat of anger is no longer in there, that it loses its power. But actually, it's quite the opposite. It's quite the opposite. When, when we can move forward with kindness, with equanimity, with compassion, it's far more powerful because we do take the energy out of the reaction from the people listening to us. We remove the need for the argument. So in the course that I'm going to be offering on equanimity, Part of the course, and there there will be many many meditations offered in the course. It's not just theoretical; it's it's very practical and pragmatic. And one of the practices that we'll be engaging in is we offer uh, phrases of equanimity to our own heart, and then we visualize or imagine uh, what our life would look and feel like if the phrases were completely reflective of our own life circumstance. It's really a beautiful practice. This comes from fifth century AD uh, from a, a Thai monk named Bodhidasa, who developed this type of practice uh, with all of the, what's known as the 
four immeasurables in the Buddhist tradition. Those are loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And so uh, this practice that Bodhidasa developed, we offer the phrases to our heart and we visualize that phrase unfolding. And in that practice, then resistances start to come up. Like, oh, that'll never happen. That's ridiculous. That's impossible. Or, or it might just feel like a, a kind of wall around the heart. And so we get to know the resistances very well because it is those resistances that keep us from experiencing equanimity. They keep us locked into the reactive patterns. The resistances aren't wrong, they're not bad, they're normal, they're natural, they're, they're protective and intelligent and smart, but they're outdated. We don't need them anymore. And so here, I'll just read through the phrases. And we won't do an actual meditation today. But if you're interested to do a full meditation with these phrases, you can find them on my podcast. Go to anywhere that podcasts are, can be listened to, Apple or Spotify. Put in the website name, Such Sweet Thunder, and scroll through for equanimity. And you'll likely find courses. Uh, uh, podcast meditations with these phrases. So I'll just read through them rather slowly. And the invitation is to bring the phrase to your heart and really just imagine uh, what your life would look and feel like if each phrase was completely reflective of your life circumstance. May I be free from preference and prejudice. May I know things just as they are. May I experience the world knowing me just as I am. May I see into whatever arises. So just holding those phrases, what comes up when we think of uh, what the world might look and feel like for us, if we could really move through our day free from preference and prejudice, what would that be like? Now, there's sometimes some confusion around this phrase it's not that we're free from the prejudices that land on us, at least not in this phrase, that's coming in, the, in later phrases, but here free from uh, the prejudices that we might harbor towards other people or other experiences. So what would our life, what would our experience of our day, what would our experience of the next hour feel like if we could experience that one hour without any preferences or prejudices. Check it out as an experiment. What would your next 15 minutes feel like without any preferences or prejudices? The second phrase, may I know things just as they are.
So just feeling what that might feel like. If you could know uh, life as it was unfolding, just in that pure state of the unfolding. We could bring this back to actually the felt experience of the body. What would, what would our experience of our own body be like if we could feel the sensations of the body as they are, without any visualization or imagination of our body, without any concept of the body, without any word body, or word legs or feet or back or shoulders or head or face? What would our experience of our body be like? If we could really just feel the body just as it is. That's just one example of how one might explore that particular practice of equanimity. May I experience the world knowing me just as I am. And I find that this phrase usually brings the most resistance for people that I work with. You know, that inner critic can be so tenacious. We're happy to have the world experience us just as we are uh, when we can titrate that, <laughs> right? Maybe uh, just to know, uh, to experience, or to know me, to know 10% of me. But the phrase is, may I experience the world knowing me exactly as I am, without any ego there, right? That's a completely egoless state. What would that be like? And so very often the resistances that might come up there will be like, yeah, but if they know this, then they'll, they'll judge me. They'll criticize me. Nobody will like me. But we can go a little bit deeper than that with that phrase. Recognizing that if the world really knew us just as we are, then they would know the divinity of who we are. We could experience the world knowing us in our divinity. knowing us as the Buddha within, our Buddha nature, or the Christ within, or knowing us as Allah, or knowing us as the creator that we are. May I experience the world knowing me, free from preference and prejudice, just as I am. May I see into whatever arises. This also brings up resistance very often for people. What does that exactly mean? May I see into whatever arises. And I could give some suggestions around that, but I, I think it's more fun for us just to explore that. And so perhaps uh, my invitation to you all is to hold that phrase or any one of these phrases over the next week. And if anything, any questions or, or shares come up, uh, feel free to message me, let me know. Let me know what's coming up for you. If you hold one or more of these phrases, but really this last phrase I think can be really, uh, a really rich exploration. What would life be like if we could really see into whatever arises? What does that mean exactly? What does that mean for you? Hmm. This great way has no difficulties. 
if we can be free from preference and prejudice. But make the slightest distinction and heaven and earth are set infinitely apart. If you wish to see the truth, hold no opinions for or against anything. To set up what we like against what we dislike is the dis-ease of the mind. Thank you all for joining me for this uh, first edition of Equanimity. I'll be back again next Saturday around the same time doing something quite similar, but a different talk. And hope to see you on the retreat. If you really feel this is a intriguing or it might be a rich exploration for you to take a deep eight week dive into the qualities of equanimity. Again, visit the website suchsweetthunder.org and you can find out more about the retreat program there. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. I really appreciate you all being here. And um, see you next time. Have a great evening, a great morning, a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.